Awesome. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, I hope everybody has ate plenty of that great brisket that we had for lunch. I, I, yeah, that's what I said too. Thumbs up. All right, we're going to be talking about rolling out IPv6. The very first question is, can everybody hear me? Awesome. I love that. All right. So how many people in here have IPv6 IP addresses but have not rolled them out at all? Awesome. You got IP addresses. That's the very first step. All right. And how many people are interested in rolling out IPv6 fairly quickly, let's say within the next three to five months? Okay. All right. So what we're going to cover today is we're going to talk about how you can get your IPv6 prefix. I know a lot of you already have them. But uh, we're going to talk about how you get that. We're going to talk about setting up BGP with IPv6. Uh, it's very, very simple, very basic. We got some screenshots. We'll show you that. And then we're going to talk about subnetting. And subnetting is kind of an odd entity because different regions, like Aaron, has a very good suggestion to use a very specific size block for every sub. Uh, my suggestion is to use a different size. But we'll talk about that when we get there. We're also going to talk about setting up OSPF v3. Very, very easy to set that up. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the main differences that you're going to need uh, with IPv6 with rolling out to customers. So this means uh, if you have a router, or a, I'm sorry, a CPE that is a router, as well as if you have a CPE that's a bridge, as well as if you have a CPE that's a router, and then the customer places a router behind it. We actually have to make, uh, make sure that all that works as well. So again, my name is Dennis Burgess, in case you didn't know. Uh, I uh, actually wrote a book called Learn Router OS. Uh, I, think, I don't think we got any more, but uh, we have, do consulting work, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, we support pretty much every brand product out there. So if there's any type of support you need, give us a call. Give us a call. Uh, we can go from there. So the very first thing you need to do is to go to Aaron. You need to get your slash 36. You guys as ISPs can request from a slash 32 to a slash 36. And guess what? You do have to pay for it, but it costs $500 a year to get that slash 32 slash 36. Now, for those of you that have any size allocation from Aaron. So if you have one slash 24 from Aaron, you qualify for a slash 36 immediately. All you have to do is say, hey, I need my V6, uh, my, my initial ISP uh, V6 allocation. They're going to go through a few steps. You're going to pay for it, and you will get it. Okay, V6 is very, very easy to get. We, uh, they try to make it very easy to get because they want V6 to be rolled out. And especially as small WISPs or even large WISPs, we should be rolling out V6. There's definitely advantages to do that. So then we get our IPv6. Now we need to set up BGP. It's set up very, very similarly with IPv4. It really depends on your ISP, though. Uh, I do know some ISPs, they use one session for both v4 and v6. That's perfectly acceptable, but most of them are going to set up a second session. So in this particular case, I have IPv6 Cogent, we put the remote AS, we put their remote address. They will give you, or the, your ISP should give you, some form of IP address that you can use on your WAN side, so on your connection. I've seen WISPs, or I'm sorry, I've seen... Uh, ISPs give out slash 126s. I have seen them give out slash 64s. Uh, it does not matter. Just give, get whatever they give you, and then we can go from there. One of the other things that I always do is I always change the hold time, and I always put a keep alive time. The hold time is how long those prefixes will stay valid in the event that we don't get any updates from their end. So with this setting here, basically within 30 seconds, we'll start withdrawing all the routes if their BGP peer goes down. So the normal t default is like 180, uh, which I think is a little, little much. Uh, but if you want to leave it at 180, that's up to you. Uh, we also put in and out filters. I would highly, 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 highly recommend that every BGP peer you have have separate in and out filters. I don't care if you use your filter to a link to one section, that's perfectly fine. But anytime you make a change in in and out filter, it will reset your peer. So just keep that in mind. I always make sure I put that in there. Then when we go to the advanced tab, maybe, we have a, uh, 
Oh, there it is. It's way down here. For those of you that I'm standing in the way, I apologize. The slides will be available. Uh, we do have the IPv6 address family, and then we typically put an update source. Um, if you have a singular IP from uh, your upstream, you'll put your IP address in there. If not, you can simply put the interface that that one v6 address is on. Okay. Uh, if you do not do that, most likely it will establish, but as you start making other peering sessions, eventually it may not establish anymore. Uh, so I would highly recommend, again, that's another uh, best practice that I have. I always put the update source in. So once we get our BGP4 established, we will get our prefixes. Uh, we get updates. We get uh, all this data. Notice they are using 180 second hold time, but we are using a 30 second hold time. So that is important to make sure that that comes up. Uh, I've never seen that have any issues. As long as they, your ISP has experience with V6, this should be very, very easy. The people, how many people are on Zao in here? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've had several ISPs completely give me incorrect subnet information, uh, mostly because we go from nine to A in uh, IPv6, so they don't really realize that. Um, but anyway, so now let's talk about how much IP space you're gonna give each customer. So in IPv6, there is no NAT. So the whole premise of, hey, I'm going to give a customer a private subnet that is not directly accessible to the internet is no longer there, okay? So what we try to do is we need to give them the minimum prefix size. So even uh, most Android phones, as well as the latest revision of Windows 10, has done away with DHCP v6. So there's no more DHCP v6 in most Android phones as well as uh, the latest version of Windows 10. The reason is we have a thing called Slack, and that is stateless auto configuration. Uh, basically, the Windows computer or the Android phone says, hey, I need a prefix, and then your router will have a prefix that it's advertising. And then that router will give them that prefix, and then everything else is automagic. We won't go into all of that, but the big thing to, think, uh, to keep in mind here is that the minimum prefix size for stateless auto config to work is a slash 64. So you would uh, typically associate the minimum prefix size that I want to give to my customers is a slash 64. Well, I would sit there and state that that's probably a really good thing, but I would actually probably give them a little bit more. What if they have a guest network at their house? What if they have, you know, it's a small business, and what if they have a production network and then they have a shop network? Something like that. So they may need several prefixes to give out to all the LAN segments that they have. I personally recommend a slash 60. This goes against what Aaron says that the recommended prefix size is. They recommend currently a slash 48. That is 65,536 64s per household. I, I think it's crazy. I don't think that it is right. Whenever I sit there and think back, whenever uh, IPv4 first came out, you could just simply call up Aaron and say, hey, I want a slash eight. And they'd go, okay, here you go. Now we're in this boat that we're in currently, which is there's no more IPv4 available for the most part. So. I don't recommend giving out slash 48s, but I'm making sure everybody's aware that Aaron recommends a slash 48. Uh, I, AP Nick does not recommend slash 48s. They actually recommend a slash uh, 60 or uh, 56. So it really is up to you on what you wish to give out. If you wish to give out a slash 64 to every sub, go for it. That is totally up to you. Note that if they have a second subnet or if they have a guest network, then that's not going to be V6 enabled. So just keep that in mind. So again, uh, Aaron's recommendation is a slash 48. Um, they think that this right here is more than enough IP space uh, for a customer to remember. I always sit there and say, if I have a business customer that needs a slash 48, I'll route it to them. It's not a big deal but I'm not going to give it to them by default and chew up all that IP space 
if uh, they don't need it. And I would not uh, think that grandma and grandpa sitting in their uh, house with one computer and no Wi-Fi needs uh, 65,536-64s. I just don't think that that's needed. <laughs> All right. Uh, again, there are plenty of other resources. If you want to see what size of prefix you want to give out, it's, there's plenty of other resources out there. Uh, another registry says 48s to 56s. Another, red, another particular group says 64s, or I'm sorry, 60s are perfectly fine. I think 60 is a good number because that gives each sub 16 slash 64s. So they can have 16 different subnets behind whatever device you have at their, uh, their location. So, again, this is uh, kind of some more, uh, I guess I should have hit my button a little bit more, but uh, basically the same stuff. We do like to split down on the nibble boundaries, so we don't want to subnet it so much. So if we go from a 64, the next step is a 60. That gives you right on the nibble boundary. Uh, if you need more IPs, you can go to slash 56. That's 256 slash 64s. Uh, and then you can go up from there. And that just keeps all of your subnetting nice and clean. Uh, you don't have to think about it too much. So let's talk about setting up OSPF. We talked about setting uh, up BGP for V6. Very, very simple, very basic. Uh, but now OSPF V3, it's even easier. So basically what we're going to do is you uh, need to add any interface that you wish to do one of two things. One, talk OSPF on as well as any interface that you wish to uh, advertise into OSPF. So in my particular case, anything that is on uh, my backhauls, I'm going to make point to point, because those are only talking to another router. Then I simply create another interface, maybe called customers. Maybe that's where all my, uh, my switches are connected. And that customer interface, I will actually put in there. Um, but then I will sit there and set the network type as NBMA or some other network type so that nothing else comes up with it. Um, what I don't want to see is I don't like logging into routers and seeing all interfaces set to some other point. I would actually recommend the very first step is you go to uh, OSPF v3, add all interfaces, and then set it to passive so that by default, nothing will talk OSPF v3. That is what I recommend with, v uh, with OSPF as well as OS OSPF v3. Um, something else, I see this quite a bit. I see a lot of people that they distribute connected routes. That's perfectly fine if there's a perfect need for it, but typically that will only cause problems. And the reason we get that is we get a lot of people that like to put their local LAN subnet so that they can plug their tech into their router. Uh, and then once you have two of those on the network, now they're competing and they're saying, oh, I know where 192.168 88 is and then the other router goes well I received that and I installed it but now I know where 192.168.88 is so we typically do not use uh, install or distribute connected routes uh, unless there is an actual need to do so and there have been a few that I have seen but um, but that's it that's how simple OSPF v3 is there's no more networks tab you don't have to define networks or anything like that you just have to simply place OSPF v3 on an interface um, by default, you do not need to assign IP addresses to those interfaces. You can assign slash 64s, or you can assign slash 126s between your routers if that is something that you wish to do. However, I normally don't do that. We simply use our local link addresses, so the FE80 addresses on, uh, on OSPF v3. All right. So now we're going to get into the IPv6 address configuration. So we're going to talk about Slack. We're going to talk about uh, if we wish to use DHCP v6. Uh, how many people in here use PPoE? Yay, you guys are already set. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the CPE configuration. How can we route a prefix to a router behind a router automatically? So we're going to talk about that. So as I said, Slack, how do we configure that? Well, what we typically do is we put an IP address in, and then we simply check the box that says advertise. That basically says this prefix is going to be the prefix advertised on that uh, particular LAN segment. Uh, extremely easy to do. Um, and again, I'm going to show you how to do this on your local uh, microtechs, that type of stuff here in a minute. But that's the simplest way. 
So next we're gonna talk about if we're gonna be using DHCP v6. So again, since we don't have NAT, we can't just simply give the, give the customer a single IPv6 address and then everything magically NAT out doesn't work. We actually have to give them a prefix. So in this case, we're gonna probably give them a prefix, let's say a slash 60. That prefix has 16 slash 64s, and now they can do whatever they want with those. They can route them through their network. If they have a network, they can assign them to multiple LAN interfaces. They can do anything they want with them. So the very first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create a DHCP v6 pool. So uh, we create our pool. So what I normally do, especially on tower sites, is I usually assign a slash 48 per tower site. Again, I have plenty of IP space, and if I need to, if I have a sub that needs a slash 48, I'll go ahead and route them that slash 48. It's not a big deal if they request it. But by default, I would simply assign each tower site uh, a slash 48. If you have a, uh, if you're like a, a centralized concentrator, like VPLS or something like that, uh, again, I would probably just start with a slash 48 uh, or maybe a slash 44 just to get started. I would not assign my entire slash 36 to that prefix pool, okay? But then in here, I also have a prefix length, and this is what length of prefix that I'm going to hand out. I then go to my DHCP v6 server. I put it on a bridge group. Uh, I have my address pool that I've already named, uh, and then my lease time is the default. Very, very simple, very basic. So then, let's say I have a CPE. My CPE is a microtech, and that microtech needs to do a routed prefix uh, from my tower site. So I'm gonna set a DHCP client. I'm gonna say I wish to get it from a, uh, I wish to get a prefix, and I'm going to create a new pool. So this pool name is a new pool on the CPE itself. Now we don't even know, we don't even have anything in that pool until this actually pulls an IP address or a prefix, all right? So if I hit apply on this particular DHCP client, it's going to get a pool and it's going to add that pool, this prefix of the slash 60 to the pool automatically. That's it. So now our CPE has learned a DHCP v6 prefix. In this case, we got a slash 60 that 60 on our tower router has already routed all of that information to this CPE. So anything going, trying to get to this slash 60 is already routed. Now all we need to do is create our Slack configuration for any type of device inside that router. So anybody on the LAN side. So what I'll do is I put colon colon one, this is me, you can put anything you want, slash 64, but then I'm gonna say from pool IPv6, and then I'm gonna set it to advertise. Soon as I hit apply on that, I'm immediately going to get this particular prefix, which is again, part of this slash 60. So now I immediately get this slash, uh, the slash 64, and I'm already advertising it. Let's say I have a second subnet. Let's say that uh, other prefix or that other subnet is for my guest network. I do the exact same thing. I specify the same pool. The difference is I'm gonna set a different interface. So this one's on either three. And whenever I do that, it immediately pulls the next slash 64 from my IP pool. Very easy, very simple. There's no NAT involved, so we don't have to mess with NATing or anything like that. All right, any questions on the DHCP before I keep going? I'm going through this really quickly, and I hope everybody's getting it-ish. No questions? So DHCP is used to assign a prefix to another router device. Slack is used to give the final end user client device its IP. And it doesn't actually give it an IP, it simply gives it a prefix and then the IP is automatically figured out. So uh, keep in mind, in a slash 64, there's 18 quintillion IP addresses. 
There's a lot of them. So literally in, on Windows boxes, if you get one Slack address, so you, you get your prefix, and then it usually uses a portion of the MAC address to generate the rest of it, right? Well, that doesn't mean that that's the only IP address, IPv6, that it's actually going to use. It'll actually generate other ones as you're using it uh, and appear to come from other IPs as well within that prefix. Any other questions? Nope, okay. All right, so again, I typically recommend a 48 to the pop, a slash 60 onto the CPE. But what happens if the customer has a router? This is where we kind of run into this, uh, this issue. How many people here run routed CPEs, actual routed CPEs on the tower or on the, the customer home? So out of those that have their hands up, if you can put your hands back up, how many deploy bridged APs inside? Or do you just simply put a Microtech CPE or a Microtech 951 or a HAP, something like that in there? Okay. So this is another example. So we have a slash 60 here. And we typically have a slash 64 between the CPE and our customer router. But for our customers to actually get online with IPv6, we actually have to deploy one other thing. We actually have to do another DHCP prefix delegation out of the same pool that we've already used to the customer router. Now, there have been some uh, various manufacturers of equipment. Nobody in here is like uh, Samsung, LG, refrigerators, believe it or not, that they will actually request their own slash 64 prefix. Yes, 18 quintillion IPs for a refrigerator. Don't ask me why they do it, but they do. So whenever you get into this level, now it's getting very difficult for us to give out enough IPs uh, and or be able to give the refrigerator their IP addresses. But you can simply extend this if you wish to. So what we do here is, again, uh, I, get, I did all that, but on here we simply put a DHCP uh, v6 pool, and it's going to be that same pool that we created back here. So again, I'm going to go right back here. So again, I got the DHCP client and I named it just IPv6. Now we're just going to pull from that same pool any other slash 64. And then when our customer router requests a prefix, it will at least get a individual slash 64. It doesn't help us for the LG refrigerators, but it does help us get IPv6 to the end user. All right, for those of you that use PPOE, I, uh, I have to make sure, I, I don't even know if I have a slide in here or not. PPOE is super easy. All you have to do is go to your PPOE settings and say, grab from this IP pool, this IPv6 pool. That's it. I mean, literally bump the sessions, and as long as they have v6 enabled, they will get their prefix uh, routed to them accordingly. That is the easiest quickest and fastest method of rolling out IPv6 at this point in time. One of the problems that we have with IPv6 is we have two separate stacks, two different IP stacks. So we have, that's what we call dual stack. We have IPv4 and then we have IPv6. And currently there is one-ish mechanism to identify the same sub what IPv4 address they had and what IPv6 address they had, other than PPOE. PPOE, one tunnel, doesn't matter. All of your queuing, if you give them a 10 meg by 10 meg plan, it doesn't matter if they're using V4 or V6. They will all be queued accordingly because the queue is built onto the tunnel versus the actual IP addresses. But if you're doing DHCP, now you have two authentications. You have one authentication in IPv4, and then you have another authentication in IPv6. And there's many manufacturers, uh, depending on which billing platform you have, et cetera, that have not figured out exactly how to do that. There is a DHCP option 82. Very, uh, it's another option. I think it's option 112. Don't quote me on that. Uh, that is very similar to option 82 inside uh, IPv6. Uh, I do know some manufacturers are using it, some manufacturers are not. So 
my recommendation is, if at all possible, use P -P -P uh, PPPoE. It, it does work. It works perfectly. There's no reason not to use it other than uh, mostly legacy issues that have been solved for years and years and years. So, all right. With that said, again, I went really, really quickly. I was hoping to have a lot more questions. But any other questions, queries, posers, or other informational tidbits? I think I'm like super early, ain't I? Yeah. So the question is, is will PPOE automatically handle IPv4 and IPv6? Is that correct? Okay. The answer is yes, it will. It is very, very simple. You simply go to the PPP profile, and there is an option for which IPv6 pool to pull from. That's it. Now, Microtech recently has introduced uh, the IPv6 uh, framed address and the framed prefix address. So if you have a billing system that uses those, they can push a prefix to an, a, a particular sub. All right, and that's actually from uh, in radius. It's been in there for quite a while. Uh, again, it just depends if the billing system actually uses that or not. Um, but what's really nice about PPOE, as soon as it comes up, the, the tunnel in the queuing does not fall on either the IPv6 address or the prefixes that was given to that sub. It simply goes to the tunnel that gets created. That same tunnel, that PPOE session, carries both protocols simultaneously. So if you're downloading, let's say you have a 10 meg package and you're downloading a file on IPv4 and then you go, hey, I'm going to fire up my V6 and I'm going to go download uh, on IPv6, you're still only going to get 5 meg on each download. So it, it works extremely, extremely well. I know we had another question. I apologize. Definitely want all the home users to hear. Uh, are there any uh, security stuff that, that you would recommend to implement IPv6 though with best practices? So that is a really good question that's probably better, uh, I would sit there and say better left for another session, but we have plenty of time, so I'll answer it. Um, as far as that goes, what I typically do for residential customers is I simply say if, the packets are going towards my residential customers and it's a new connection, I drop those. So the ideal is, is that any new connections going to my subs, I would simply drop those. That way, no outside, uh, no outside of my network packets can be originated and starting a connection inside. Security is a very major thing that you really need to take consider because every cell phone, every refrigerator, every thermostat, every device on that network will have a valid public IP. Now, I did read an interesting study about that, is that there was a IP scanner that could scan the entire V4 internet in an hour. Really cool, all right? If you tried to use that same IP scanner at the same rate that it scanned v, uh, IPv4s, it would take like 530 years to scan a single slash 64. That's how many IPs we're talking about. Now, there's other technologies that they use to do that, but you do have to be very uh, conscious about that. Now, the only downside of blocking inbound new connections like that is Xbox, because Xbox will use IPv6, and it prefers to use IPv6, if at all possible. So if you're blocking inbound connections, basically if they're hosting a game, uh, they have issues with that. Uh, so it basically comes up as NAT strict or something like that. But as far as them connecting to game servers, things like that, it all works just fine. So uh, normally for business customers, I, I take the exact opposite approach. Block everything except what is what we need to allow in. Very, very similar to a NAT system except uh, in your uh, IP firewall. Right behind you. Behind you. There you go. Is uh, IPv6 finally going to fix our NAT problems on uh, VoIP phones? The answer is it should because there is no, let me rephrase this, there's not generally NAT with IPv6. Okay. So your VoIP phone, whichever that ATA or whatever that phone is, should have direct connectivity to the VoIP server. 
then you're blocking new. Uh, well, it's, it would try to it would try to uh, register first. So. Correct. It should it should establish that path already. So uh, we do we do use VoIP in our office, and we do have a VoIP server that does have IPv6. We've never had any issues. Now our VoIP server is on a public. Uh, usually, the big problem with that is when the VoIP server is behind NAT itself. Um, most of the time, when the VoIP server is on the public interface, you usually don't have any issues with that. So I know we had a couple other questions, or I thought we did. <laughs> this goes back to earlier when setting uh, IP addresses on your interfaces for IPv6. Um, is there a way you can specify so Ether3 always pull the second slash 64 out of the pool and Ether4 always pull the first slash 64? So the, I think the, the general answer would be no, but once you've assign the pool and you've hit apply mm -hmm. that IP address is on that interface unless that pool changes right and that's what I was kind of thinking sometimes if the microtick reboots it'll get the same prefix back from the ISP but then the address ranges would be different for each of the interfaces potentially but, right I, I have never had that problem yet but I'm sure it's probably happened all right microtech what are you gonna do about that no, just kidding just kidding <laughs> Typically, the stateless autoconfig is usually very, very fast, and the next boot or the next reboot of your phone or the next time your phone disconnects from Wi-Fi and connects back, it's going to get the new address anyway. So any other questions, queries, posers? Come on, guys. We got time. Nothing. Nothing. There we go. Thank you very much. Thank you.